All right, welcome to a series that I put together uh, for uh, the clinical part of the lab. This, this is one of the difficult things to try to do online is to convey to you uh, how we test and identify unknown bacteria. And I appreciate your patience. It's taken a while to pull this together. Uh, so this is part one. And uh, the big picture uh, is this is my uh, uh, work to try to present to you sort of the background information that's required to, un to identify unknowns. Uh, it'll be a series of presentations and at the end of this hopefully you will apply everything that you've learned and I will give you the information and data sheets that you'll uh, need and you'll get to play the, uh, the position of a clinical uh, microbiologist uh, even if you haven't played one on TV and the idea is uh, you take the the data and you become the detective and using the evidence that you have at hand you identify the uh, offending bacteria by its signature it leaves or its trace uh, evidence uh, of the biochemical data and the various other things that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about and unfortunately there's no real good way to do this in such a way I can send you a kid or something like that we tried that uh, so uh, we apply and build on the skills, hopefully, that you've uh, obtained, uh, and I'll recapitulate uh, 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 those during this video. I will also provide some links to additional videos for other professionals that perform certain techniques just to, to kind of uh, drill that in, but uh, I'd love to get your feedback. Uh, at the end, you'll have fun, you'll have clinical cases. You'll have the data and uh, you'll have, uh, we'll talk about the data trees and things so you can define and become the Sherlock Holmes to identify the offending type of bacteria uh, most likely responsible and clinically and, and what recommendations uh, you would uh, pr pr uh, provide for the doctor. So let's get started here. So these are traditional methods there are a whole host of, of different techniques I, I worked in several different clinical labs and every lab has a focus and sort of their skill sets as they fall uh, this is going to be just a traditional type of uh, methodology that I'm going to go over and it accomplishes what we need to do in clinical microbiology but I just want you to know that this sort of technology I'm going over is a standard bench microbiologist type of approach. In the new fangal world that we have, the real one, the real world that we live in, is really with rapid ID because every minute that goes by uh, that we don't have an answer or some direction for the doctor, then it's life threatening. So we can't play. Uh, so we have. Uh, more genetic methods and things like that to accomplish it but having said that it's it's very important to get the basis first of what we're trying to achieve and the types of basic tests that we run now if we look for the same things but use different methods it doesn't really matter because you can always learn a technique is understanding why we do things and what's different about these bacteria that allow us to make these uh, conclusions and that's really what we're after but don't fall short of the idea is your Sherlock Holmes it's the preponderance of the evidence that uh, uh, convicts a bacteria to being the, the culprit there may be a few points of data that won't fit and that is something we understand because genetics of the organism does change or there are environmental effects that can turn on and turn off certain genes that show up clinically when we run a biochemical test or something like that so we, we have to uh, if we don't feel we have enough data we run more tests different types of tests uh, to confirm uh, again it's the preponderance of the evidence it's the best analogy because not all the time we have the best data to convict a, a, a felon 
but it's the preponderance of this data that, that makes it in, uh, inescapable that uh, that is with the best of our knowledge uh, is what's causing the problem so I wanted to get that across and we do a little bit of serology uh, in this it, it'll be done of course from a virtual point of view but uh, we use antibodies to detect certain characteristics of outer membranes like uh, having uh, a, a class of strep or we'll talk about that uh, when that time comes but we do uh, a few and then of course uh, the molecular microbiology is where it's at these days but again understanding the basis uh, is important the molecular is just a quicker way to determine the things that we're going to talk about uh, using genetic methods that uh, again is is really expensive uh, but not time consuming that's the key we save the time for the patient so the other point I want to make and uh, this gets shoved under the carpet and it's, you know it, it took me years when I was in uh, graduate school to come to this point and uh, it's an important one uh, it's not just enough to identify a bacterial species so let's say we oh it's a salmonella and it's known to cause this type of diarrheal disease or it's a bloody stool and all this further delineation will be needed to identify uh, confidently between two species from the same genus so salmonella typhimurium or salmonella typhus or things like that uh, are really important and that gets even trickier yes we can identify salmonella from E. coli okay now within the salmonella what are we talking about and that is where more of the genetics tools come into play uh, in in the real world but there are the same sort of biochemical delineations that we use but we have to dig deeper in order to get the difference between two species from the same genus okay so they give uh, an example here Eurasinia has about 15 species of which part of a normal human microflora Eurasinia we know Eurasinia pestis that causes the bubonic plague that's a bad boy that is a nasty one and but that's not to say Eurasinia entrolytica or one of the other Eurasinia uh, uh, you know uh, may uh, uh, be uh, present but it's not the causative agent for the bubonic plague so just to say that we have uracinia present doesn't do it uh, we, we have to pin it down and that's why we have the genus and species to worry about and so again you can look at all the uh, different genes and things that we can use uh, genetically to determine uh, the uh, the species uh, of these uh, uh, when when called for the genera is as you can see here we can do that pretty easily uh, with the genetics um, but we can even pin it down more so that's the key that's I, I just wanted to bring that up this the key point is that yes we can identify uh, the genera but we also need to worry about the species and and again that does that gets lost sometimes and I just wanted to convey that uh, so not to belabor it so clinical diagnostic lab when when we talk about that in especially a hospital setting you have got to pay attention to the SOPs the standard operating procedures I in your mind I would like you to translate standard operating procedures to CYA cover your you know what because um, if there is a problem see in human medicine it's a tragedy to lose a life and a lot of times it may come to a lawsuit and they will go through the entire pattern you know uh, the, the handling of however something was done to every individual involved in that particular case you follow standard operating procedures in other words someone has worked out all of the steps for doing a procedure and those will be battle proof in other words you go into court those things will be good but if you start to deviate or creating your own uh, good luck because now you're in a uh, in, in open waters and uh, you're 
most likely going to get hammered if it ever does come to court. Now, I'm not going to say that they do, but uh, you have to hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. So you always make sure you follow standard operating procedures and you document as such. And uh, becoming familiar with uh, all of the equipment in the lab, uh, pull the, uh, the operations manual for each of those, read them, have them, keep them in a notebook, and uh, that way you can function beautifully in a clinical lab type of setting. And of course, the biggest problem with standard operating procedures is having all the right equipment and somewhere along the line, you're going to have to scrimp, you know, you're going to have to substitute. That's not really acceptable. In other words, you've got to make sure you have this, be able to do all the steps that are included in a standard operating procedure. I've run across this numerous times. And if, the, if it requires a deviation from a standard operating procedure in terms of the equipment used, uh, you're pretty well safe if you well document that, including control numbers and stock numbers and all those things. Uh, you, know, you know, unfortunately, we're just at that stage these days where we have to do that sort of thing. But uh, again, just a tip from your Uncle Ed. So uh, a lot of times the doctor will order a specimen to be taken. Then how that specimen is to be collected is an SOP. Uh, then the specimen is transported aseptically in some sort of container that is well documented. So there's a management of ownership through every stage as we go through. Specimen processing and handling again, the testing, uh, SOPs all the way. Uh, the re results interpretation is the fun part where you, you uh, get to uh, reveal the information and then you start to compile that information and then uh, the analytics being okay it's resistant to this and that and these and those and it's sensitive to this we think it's this organism and uh, this is how we're going to uh, approach treating uh, the patient for this particular organism or organisms it could be more than one uh, we can't bias ourselves the standard type of reporting, here is a, a typical type form uh, in a clinical lab, and you can see these sorts of things. Uh, this is one out of the textbook, and it's, it's a good one. I mean, this is about, uh, when I was at the vet school, ours was actually had more uh, because of the types of things that we looked at for a cross wide range of animals. Uh, a large animal, small animal, uh, then you had your birds and things like that, and it, it gets really uh, a lot of data, it gets confusing. Humans, we have one, okay, at least it's a two-legged, it could be male or female, uh, but you only have to deal with one. And so uh, performing biochemical or genetic based testing or on these clinical, uh, clinically obtained samples, it, it gets uh, summated in a uh, black or white type of report like this. Was it present? Yes. Uh, and then you have recommendations as to the type. Now if you notice on the form, uh, some of these only carry the um, genera name. And again, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, sometimes they delineate those. Uh, and I was curious how they look at this like Clostridium difficile. They, they pin down the species. You can have other type of clostridia, um, but deficile certainly has a different meaning than, let's say, one that causes gas gangrene or something like that. So anyhow, it's usually um, delineated. Uh, I make it a habit if I do the, the work to identify the species that I write it down and then I have a different form as to how I pin down that particular one as backup. The doc won't see it. But if I'm ever challenged, I will have it, and it will have up here uh, the uh, uh, antibiotic therapy and the diagnosis, all that. But the specimen number, and then the uh, the person, your name goes right on it. Uh, usually, there is a barcode that's in uh, up here that lists who the technicians are, who was involved, the case number, the patient, the whole nine yards, 
and it's all captured so again it's a nice form and we might use something similar to this uh, when I ask you to identify your unknown uh, based on a clinical case that I will give you uh, at the end now this will be uh, we have time to to go and learn through the clinical uh, portions of this again what I'm asking you to do at the end of this is your clinical diagnosis based on the preponderance of cl clinical evidence and that's I guess the reason I mention this now is uh, I've done this enough times where students forget the big picture is it, why are we doing this test and this test and this test and you get kind of wound up into the forest uh, the trees, the individual trees, and not looking at the overall big picture while we're doing this. So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, so what we're going to be doing is to identify unknowns, we're going to observe their physical characteristics. Now I will use anything uh, to help identify microorganisms. Some of them will be just for me uh, just to know a little bit of information so I can use somewhat of uh, my instinct as to what tests I might want to run. Uh, anything that uh, helps in uh, our understanding. And some of the basic things are looking at them under a microscope. Microscopes, you know, absolutely required. Uh, I don't know any clinical labs where uh, at least from a microbiologist, even with all the fancy dancy genetic tools, we still look at them uh, using a microscope. Based on that, just the shapes and uh, that we see under the microscope, uh, it gives us at least a direction uh, we might want to pursue in the diagnostics that we're going to run. Um, and then we run the certain biochemical characteristics, uh, growth parameters, um, just using standard procedures. Now all of the aseptic stuff that we've gone over comes into play. Uh, you, you should do these things with, and I shouldn't have to say do this sort of thing. It's expected that it's done with the aseptic technique. And unfortunately being online and virtual it's hard to to relate to it in a terms of a physical but I'm going to dr drill it as if you had the physical hands-on uh, because you've seen the steps and procedures uh, so I want you thinking about those as we go through this best we can do and we move on with that um, so I always like to do a gram stain and that tells me right away characteristics of the cell wall and its basic shape so that's why I put that up front here at the top the cell wall and its shape and at least now I it's gram positive and it is a uh, coxie. It's it's uh, it's a uh, clumps comes in uh, grape-like clusters. Hey, that tells me a lot. I needed to confirm that. I can't say just based on that what it is. I might have some suspicions, but that's okay. I'm going to nail it uh, using uh, the physical and metabolic types of characteristics. That is the preponderance of the evidence. What? sorts of things can we do in terms of looking at characteristics well the temperature at which it grows it really helps the pH values that it needs to grow um, so a lot of the standard medias um, take advantage of either produces acids and various things but the medias usually are at seven uh, seven point four somewhere in that seven range because obviously these are human pathogens that we're dealing with uh, the ability to adapt to an osmotic pressure. Let me change that from by just saying the salt concentration. It has to deal with the osmotic pressure changes and staph versus strep and that sort of thing. Uh, and E. coli and, and other types of organisms, they all handle this osmotic challenge differently. And some can't grow and we take advantage of that. And so that is the selective nature um, of the, these sorts of things. Now, utilization of nitrogen sources, uh, which breaks down proteins, peptones, uh, amino acids, anything that contains nitrogen, uh, certain organisms can use it, some of them can't. And uh, so, utilization of a carbon source. Now, the carbon source is being the sugar. Uh, so, utilization of a sugar and 
and how it metabolizes it does it produce acid and that sort of thing it's important it's a, a very stable characteristic for a lot of types of microorganisms and we take advantage of it and the acid production is easy to determine because you put a sensitive chemical in there that is the pH change uh, the uh, chemical will change the rotation of the light so the color changes and it's a pH uh, dependent sort of thing and it makes it really easy you know red versus yellow or something like that uh, growth factors this was one of my specialties when I was going through school uh, I had to work on uh, uh, treponema pallidum that causes syphilis and the the only way to grow it at the time was to grow it in the testes of armadillos a lucky organism uh, anyhow you can see that that would be cumbersome at best to try to have to culture these things and so two years of my life I spent working out the uh, basic requirements of treponema pallidum and growing it in uh, a defined media and that was a task uh, there was a lot of papers about it some had claimed they've done it couldn't reproduce it so we we uh, created I, it wasn't just me it was the team and uh, we came up with it this is back when I was at Burr's Welcome and it, it's it's an important thing because you if you understand its growth requirements then you can uh, have a better handle on how to stop it uh, from causing disease so anyhow uh, growth factors are important vitamins special types of uh, vitamins or amino acids that have been modified methylated or something like that X or V factors, in other words, blood components and things like that. Uh, does it uh, use oxygen or is it sensitive to oxygen? So atmospheric conditions are important. We can we can look at those. Antimicrobial activity, in other words, this is huge. Of course, Burr's Welcome was a uh, big, man, big manufacturer of trimethoprim and all these other types of antibiotics and having antimicrobial activity was important and there seems to be some that have more of effect as, as a uh, antibiotic for gram positives than it does on gram negatives and which is fine I mean this is what we can utilize for studying now there are certain inherent or native type of resistances that we can take advantage of it uh, it's about 90 percent of the time Sometimes uh, it can have a mutation in the chromosome and it, it won't uh, exhibit that. But uh, we look for the resistance of various uh, characteristics. We know that they're chromosomal or extra chromosomal. Uh, the uh, bacteria have those small circular uh, uh, separate pieces of DNA we call plasmids. A lot of times they confer antibiotic uh, resistance. And anyhow, uh, we use those characteristics to uh, try to identify them. Um, certain metabolite tests like uh, the Vogue's Progner indole production various things how it metabolizes things it's it's important when we have these they're easy tests you add the bacteria usually on a slant or a tube and you incubate it overnight at 37 in the morning you have an answer and if you're in a hurry you could probably look at it in 10 hours or something like that uh, but uh, activity of various enzymes like oxidase, catalase, urease, those are key. A lot of these certain uh, genera and species only has, uh, you know, uh, oxidase activity or something like that. Now, a good example is uh, staph and strep. Those are usually, um, a lot of times, it can be very close, but you can run a catalase test in other words throw some hydrogen peroxide and a test piece as part of the uh, colony if it starts to bubble it's staph if it doesn't bubble most likely it's strep uh, it's things like that and uh, we use those tests and then um, I've already mentioned antimicrobials uh, potassium cyanide um, dyes and things uh, there are certain dyes that uh, most students forget about like in McConkie auger uh, we're going to talk about those so those dyes aren't antimicrobials per se as we like to think of an antibiotic but the dyes can bind to the membrane and clog certain entry points and it becomes starved and so there's a particular dye and um, well as we know that we use in the gram stain uh, we can also add that uh, to eliminate or to get rid of 
gram positives when we're look, working with gram negatives. So that's a component in a McConkie auger. So we take advantage of that uh, because it is a gram positive, a gram positive organism, and we'll clog its pores with a uh, particular stain that we use. And once we do that, uh, we are favoring now the gram negatives. Uh, to grow on a McConkie auger plate. So those are the sorts of things and I thought it was important to go over this list. Uh, this is the why and how for a lot of the types of tests that we're going to be running. Now we can uh, look at various tubes. Now in one laboratory we always had a battery of tests that we ran. It didn't matter what it was and it would be a series of tubes and I used to have to make up all the tubes and make sure we had plenty of them blah 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 and we'd run them and you can see these are inoculated you can see little scribbles on them perhaps some of them are some of them aren't uh, but uh, this is um, identifying so this based on any of these tests is a uh, um, the uh, simon citrate is an example this green one and if the organism uh, is positive for the citrate it'll turn the whole media blue and it's really clear so you could look at so each one of these you notice the different cap colors it kind of keys as to what the test is and that sort of thing and uh, I always run these with control so a I know what the control looks like in case it was some kind of problem I incubate them I always do that it's important to run the controls and so morphology is the gram stain, the growth on media, and colony characteristics. These are things you can look at right away, looking at the growth on a plate and that sort of thing. That's why single colony isolates are so important. Two things we have to determine right away with the single colony isolate is, is it contaminated? And in other words, the colony morphologies look very similar, consistent. And then the colony characteristics, are they dry, another wrinkly, are they mucoid, you know, like Klebsiella, it's like somebody blew their nose on the plate. It's really disgusting. But those things we can use as part of the uh, preponderance of the evidence. And so that's why we look at all of these things and be able to grade them and write them down. And uh, it's not just because I want you to, you know, uh, do well on a test and memorization or something like that. They actually have real meanings in an applied sense. And that's why I wanted you to, to know these things. Oxidase, catalase, and metabolite usage, we're going to go over those. But uh, again, uh, I, I don't mean to belabor it. So obtaining cultures from patients is a very, very important step. If the, the sample is not taken properly, we'll get contaminants. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've chased. It, it gets to the point where I know all the normal flora quite well for various regions. The genital regions always have certain types of normal flora or the oral regions, armpits or whatever. And uh, sometimes uh, a patient will have uh, an injury obtained on the road. In other words, they got uh, impaled with something and they got all sorts of soil microbes in there. And so sometimes it's it's unavoidable that you're going to get contaminants but also there's standard procedures looking at urine and that sort of thing uh, we, we have to uh, be careful uh, and train the patient because obviously in some cases only the patient can obtain it. and shyness needs to go away uh, we what we want to do is to save the patient now if they have a uh, um, let's say a kidney infection of some kind or a urinary tract infection and it takes us a while to dis to discern that meanwhile you can get in this uh, ascending nephritis where you can end up with kidney damage because we're taking too long to uh, identify the the organism so it a lot of times it's because the samples were contaminated and we want to try to minimize that also uh, I've already preached on biofilms, but biofilms, a certain sort of microorganisms come together that may be more of or considered normal flora, but what they do is they work up, in other words, like place in a highway or a making conditions suitable for a type of pathogen now to set up home. And we, we need to, to be aware of that. And um, so, and, and they play a factor. So blood, sterile fluids, 
you know, obviously you swab down and, and never reuse needles. I mean, that's kind of obvious stuff. Urine, uh, we have, and I'll use this as an example, is a very common one. And I'll tell you from personal experience working in both animal and human uh, clinical labs, uh, the urine is, uh, I've seen across the board, uh, which is just nasty. Uh, wounds, we're going to talk about that just briefly. Respiratory, sputum, uh, a lot of times you swab or uh, you do a, a local lavage uh, uh, where they cough up stuff or something like that. You know, those things, the stools, and then you're looking for anaerobes and susceptibilities across the board. And this poor lady, I can, I can sympathize. She's getting ready to do uh, testing uh, with antibiotics to see what's sensitive resistant. But I, I look at her bench and I just recognize all the, here's uh, McConkey auger plates and blood auger plates. And um, I can't read her badge, but uh, uh, boy, I, I can tell. The only thing is different. You can see the age. Now, I'm not trying to be funny or anything, but uh, when we're at a bench, we always wear gloves. And I, I chose this picture for that. It does show you in the... I was in a lab where they allowed mouse pipetting, if you can believe that. And we don't allow that anymore. We haven't for a long time. But there's certain eras of, of training. And uh, we we go overboard a little bit, which is probably a good thing um, that uh, uh, wearing the gloves is, is really, really important. So sterile containers, um, you know, order these sorts of things. It's not hard to do. Blood cultures um, and then swabs. I love these types of swabs. You can see over here, uh, it has a little bit of moisture inside, and so you can take your sample. And a lot of times, bacteria are susceptible to desiccation, that sort of thing. And I want a pretty good sample or representation of what was there, and then uh, we could do that. Blood samples usually are taken in, in uh, supportive medias and uh, sterile, of course, and then uh, we can plate them out. Uh, various ways uh, so again it's foundational principle I was drilled this uh, the test can be easily compromised or to the point where you just throw the data out uh, because specimens had not been properly collected and uh, this is a big big thing this has to go all the way to the nurses uh, to the uh, clinical side. So we always had uh, in, in the hospital I worked at was the, the, the nurse, the attending nurse would sign that uh, uh, the specimens were collected properly. And it's kind of hard because, you know, some of it's very personal. And so we're going to talk about that. Urine is has a long history, of course, has been used. Believe it or not, I mean, I'm going to bring this up, but it's gross. Uh, in the old, old days, they used to taste it. That was a joke in our clinical lab over at the vet school where um, the, we had the urine tasters. Um, <laughs> it's just a joke. It didn't actually happen. But uh, in the old days, uh, that's what they did, believe it or not. Uh, I can't believe it. I, I'm glad I don't work in that time frame. But um, the collection is the key part in how we do this. Organisms most often associated with UTIs. So here's the other aspect, the part of the investigation, is we, we do have the clinical information from the patient. We need to know that clinical information is part of our due diligence, triage, you know, is trying to get the history of what's going on. And just remember, patients lie, unfortunately, They're, especially when it comes to sexual or personal types of things or drug usage or things of the lie or drop of a hat uh, so you know that's why they're asked two or three times during their visit or stay at a hospital uh, to see if the story is consistent but anyhow given that uh, let's say a patient's come in and it's got a UTI 80% of them are E. coli what does that mean well this means that I'm going to use McConkey auger most likely, but uh, as part of my differential, and we'll see uh, what I'm talking about a little bit later, but uh, it does give us certain clues because we know there's certain pathogens that are capable of doing these sorts of things. Not to say that other organisms from time to time can do it. They can, uh, but they would be rarer. Okay, so other gram negatives that uh, we usually see, and it's usually gram negative, 
a Klebsiella, Anterobacter, Citrobacter. Okay, uh, Streptococcus has been known uh, to cause uh, an Anterococcus uh, UTIs. Staph aureus, usually it's a little bit more severe. Uh, it goes to the central nervous system, in other words, uh, spinal fluid or something like that. And uh, Saprophyticus is a species of uh, one that we worry about. So Staph aureus and uh, Staph Saprophyticus are two that uh, we worry about. But we're looking at maybe, you notice the percentages, the author didn't feel like uh, doing that. Uh, but it's about 10 to 15 percent, but it depends. You might see higher ones when you're in a university setting with teenagers. It's just really interesting. Uh, you got to have that triage. It's all part. That's why Dr. House, if you ever saw that TV show, House, that um, what made him good is that he got more of that data that uh, uh, behind the story. The story is very important as part of the overall um, uh, uh, being the Sherlock Holmes and, and on the preponderance of the evidence. It gives you clues especially in the tough cases. So the kidneys. So if you have uh, urethra and then uh, you get maybe a bladder infection or something and then it starts to ascend into the kidneys. So urinary tract infection could be down here and, uh, and then proceed and grow and that sort of thing. And so the time is of the, of the essence in terms of these, especially uh, if you're immunocompromised or elderly. So it, and in this case, this could be life-threatening. Now, when you look at the microscopic examination, you know, especially with animals, you know, you get a, a, um, a, a type of dog that comes in, let's say a Dalmatian, and you may see a lot of uh, uric acid crystals. Normally, dogs don't have that, but for some reason, certain dogs have metabolic uh, complaints or issues that can lead to more uric acids and things like that. But these, believe it or not, uh, crystals can be useful uh, in a diagnostic uh, sense of overall health. Now, they're reported uh, on, under the uh, microscopic examination. Uh, and they're not microbial. Uh, so I'm not going to dwell on it, but uh, they do help in in terms of uh, determination. Now, collection is really important. The initial cleaning and then the uh, the passing of the urine afterwards. So you want to collect the free stream that that uh, the few seconds of it you don't collect and then collect. Explaining that to a patient, you can have photo cards, you could have all sorts of things, and they're going to do it their way anyhow. Uh, but uh, the, the midstream, uh, you, you urinate for a little bit and then you collect. That's the key. It's the same with women. And again, it's, it's a private thing and you can't stand there and guarantee it, but you got to sign for it. But if you can convey that, uh, it, it really helps in the urine collection. It's, it's so important. Uh, so uh, wounds, common wounds and uh yeah, this is pretty bad. This looks like uh, skin eating uh, type of bacteria. We've got uh, it's not so bad there. But usually with a clinical wound of some kind, it could be Staph aureus, could be all sort of Cinebacters, it could be uh, molds, it could be yeast, it could be uh, all sorts of different types of microorganisms. And uh, they're problematic for the most part. So, um, Mixed anaerobes, uh, noscomals, in other words, you can get it from the hospital or some uh, retirement home, uh, MRSA, methicillin resistant, uh, Staph aureus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, other gram negative enterics can, all, can cause all sorts. It could be a combination of them as well. So, again, knowing that you have these types of wounds gives you. Now, if I notice this bandage, had a greenish and a certain pungent odor to it, uh, I can tell you that Pseudomonas would be high on my list. Pseudomonas has a unique characteristic of having green uh, in the uh, in the media when you grow them on a plate, but they also convey that uh, when they uh, go out to uh, the uh, uh, bandages and things and the odor associated with Pseudomonas virginosa is quite telling uh, 
you, you won't forget it. You smell it. And uh, I had the unfortunate reputation of being able to uh, distinguish bacteria by the odors. And uh, they tested me. And, of course, they put plates under my nose. And about uh, nine times out of ten, I could tell you what it was. And it's, uh, it's not a gift, believe me. It's a curse because, of course, my wife can tell you that, oh, I smell, you know, uh, Proteus vul vul vulgaris or something. And after a while, I was like, please. <laughs> it, I can't help it. It's just one of those things. Anyhow, uh, uh, I hope you become a microbiologist. You'll know what I'm saying. Okay, so. Uh, we use all everything that we can possibly use to figure out what's going on. So, um, respiratory infections, very common. Um, strep, pneumonia, Haemophilus influenza, Moraxellia, uh, Cataharis, uh, uh, Moraxellia bovis, and there's all sorts of different types. But again, you notice I'm listing here uh, the genera and species. Pharyngitis, Streptococcus, Pyogenes. We have certain tests. Is this bad boy? Pyogenes, bad boy. Uh, then the virals and things like that. And it's beyond my pay grade uh, to uh, identify virals. But uh, I, I'm uh, in bacteriology and that sort of area. So mycoplasma, pneumonia. Uh, so we have uh, different... Uh, microorganisms that uh, affect the upper respiratory and lower. In the lower, of course, we have different virals that can, can occur. And of course, virologists will use that information uh, if they're listening and it's the lower along. It, it, it really helps in diagnosis. But uh, bacterial too, um, streptococcus, uh, 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 streptococcus pneumoniae, mycoplasma pneumoniae, um, uh, the, uh, there's different species, Cryptosporidia, all sorts of ones that can cause uh, bacterial types. Noscomals, the Pseudomonas, typically burn patients, but you see it also with uh, older respiratory. Gram-negative enterics, Legionella, uh, all sorts of uh, ones. We had one in North Carolina not too long ago associated with hot tubs in a fair and an outbreak of Legionella's disease. Bacteria, aspiration, anaerobes, gram-negative enterics, usually what we look for. So I just wanted to, to point out that given the location, so in a clinical study, if you know the type of disease that's going on and some of the uh, details from the clinical observations can be very useful in uh, the diagnosis part for the microbiologist or the microbiology end of it. So sample collection and transport, as I say, is a really important aspect, you know, like getting the free stream from urine, which is, I would say, depending on uh, men are usually worse, you know, it, it just, they don't follow the rules. But anyhow, um, the purpose is collection, transport, patient specimens. And you can see all sorts of different types of certain hospitals have certain types for certain regions and that sort of thing. And uh, the idea is you want a good uh, collection. It could be sputum, urine, feces, fluid, aspiration, uh, uh, vein puncture, surface swabs, uh, depending on the region and uh, where the lesions are and that sort of thing. And uh, there are certain types that are used that are more reliable than others. And again, it's the SOPs. Unfortunately, uh, usually we don't have the pick. It's uh, the organization. So, uh, at least at this point in time, what we've, we've talked about is uh, sort of the synopsis of what we're thinking of, the types of things uh, that we're going to use for the preponderance of the evidence that we use to convict a, a certain organism to causing a disease, just like a court case. And one of the most important parameters is collecting the specimen so we're not chasing uh, after the wrong uh, criminal. Uh, usually it'll pan out that it's not, but uh, usually we have to assume that proper procedures were taken for the collection. So that's uh, part one is sort of the survey and why we do the certain things and the what. And then uh, 
we're going to be going into the various steps and procedures now that we would use uh, to identify and uh, utilize the data that we'd obtain. So uh, this concludes part one. Part two will be on staining bacteria and using the microscope which you've already been trained on. I'm not going to go over the microscope again. I'm just going to go over the things we use the microscope for in terms of identifying and helping us come up with data. So I hope this has been helpful and I'll catch you on part two. Uh, but for now, um, I hope this has been useful. And again, we will be preparing for uh, through these various parts uh, for you to be able to identify an unknown.